Dear Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for your power and your grace and your anointing. I thank you, Lord, for taking those those small small percentages the world says and, and coming through and saying, Hey, let me show you my hand. Let me show you my desires. Let me show you what I will do for my people. And, and, and having it run smooth and, and opening the eyes to others. Lord, I say there are, the, there are people here that are going through challenges, Lord. Grab a hold of the garment of Jesus and say, Lord, help me through this time. Give me, give me favor. Give me grace in this time. And uh, stand, up, stand up and walk in the way that he has called you to do it. In Jesus' name. Let's just extend our hands towards this family. Lord, we thank you for this neat, great, powerful thing you've done for Zegers and for little baby Shaylin. God, we ask you to continue to do what you've begun. And Lord, we pray for Cambria. Lord, that you speak to her right where she's at. And that, Lord, your hand would continue to move in her life in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Lord, we are amazed by you. <laughs> we are amazed by you. Praise the Lord. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. facing great challenges today you know the Lord has blessed you in the past and you're serving the same God who's the same yesterday, today and forever the God who helped you yesterday is going to help you tomorrow and he's going to give you grace today and you'll sing this song over that situation too just continue calling on that name that is above every name for his will to be done in Jesus name thank you Lord, let's give the Lord some more praise thank you so much Hallelujah. My name is Leila Allison. I was born and raised in Bosnia, a country torn with war and just pure devastation. As an 11-year-old child, I was exposed to so many things that no child should ever see. The snipers, the landmines. I was just terrified to step my foot out that door. I did not know whether that might be the last step I ever make. All the borders around Bosnia were closed and no humanitarian aid could come in. And that's when the country hit its bottom. There was no food coming from anywhere. Being hungry is something that you can't put in words. The painful hunger. My mom made me go to school. I begged her not to make me go to school because I did not have a decent pair of shoes. I had a old torn sneakers. My dad had used some wire and he shut them back together, but cold and wet would still squeeze through the holes that my dad didn't manage to shut. I went off to school and I was very angry. I, uh, I had made up my mind that perhaps that day I will not come back home. After uh, about an hour or so walking, I got there and uh, the kids said that they're giving these boxes out and I should go in and get one too. So I went in and uh, the man said to come over. 
and uh, he handed me this decorated shoe box. I tore the outlet open, and laying on the bottom were brand new white sneakers. Out of all the things in this world, I got shoes. I went over and I asked the man who gave me a shoe box, who sent this to me, and he told me that Jesus is God's only son. He came to this world to die for me, to show his love for me. That was the day I accepted the Lord, Jesus Christ as the Savior of my life. And today, proudly, I can say that it's because of Lord Jesus in that shoebox that I'm a Christian and I go to heaven. Here's some racer. I just can't thank him enough for giving me that chance. I can't thank him enough for finding me all the way in Wozniak. He loved me, and he showed me that. And then he took me back in the United States, and he said, but I love you more. Now you get to pack some. And now my children are the ones that get to pack it. It's just like I thank Lord over and over. Not only did I receive that shoebox as an 11-year-old girl, 15 years later, I'm in the area I grew up, and I get to deliver the same shoeboxes. Thank you for sending my shoebox. Thank you for introducing me to Jesus. May God bless you for what you're doing, and please keep continuing to do what you do. You're changing the lives forever, and you're changing them for Jesus Christ. missions it comes back to us some would protest and say let's take care of the poor right here i'm telling you the poor right here are richer than the common man and other places in the world have you found first corinthians 13 yet i want to read the whole chapter just because i love to hear the word of god Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. And then verse 6 is our text for this morning. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Can we say love is the greatest? Verse 6, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to be people that continue in your word that walk in your truth, whose steps are guided by your precepts and your principles. In Jesus' name, amen. The last part of verse 5 says that love thinks no evil. Different translations tell us that it means love does not impute evil, that is, project evil onto others or credits people with evil. Love does not keep track of wrongs, does not keep record of being wronged. 
If you love someone, obviously, you can be hurt by that person, right? But if you love them, you don't want to stay hurt by them, do you? Because you don't want anything between you and that person you love. And so you try to deal with that hurt. You try to come to a place of reconciliation. And when you come to that place, you bury that hurt. You bury the hatchet, and you don't do as a Garth Brooks song says. When we bury the hatchet, we leave the handle sticking out. Back when Rinky Tinks had music on Saturday night, it was kind of a come-as-you-are thing. I had that song all ready to go. And my wife said, baby, no. It's not good. It's not not true. And we don't need to be speaking that self over ourselves. And so... Because we had that revelation in our early days of marriage, we used to tease each other. Anytime one of us said something negative, we would say, I believe that you're a prophet and everything you say comes to pass. Well, that just cut the complaining short. And so I didn't get to sing, you know, the neighbor's lights came on last night, just like they always do. Every time we fight, it's getting to the place we just can't get along. When we bury the hatchet, we leave the handle sticking out. Oh, when we bury the hatchet, we leave the handle sticking out. We're always talking about things we should forget about. It's getting to the place we just can't get along. When we bury the hatchet, we leave the handle sticking out. Sorry, baby. (laughs) Romans 16 says, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. You know, we live in a day where the knowledge of our faults has increased. The knowledge of good and evil has increased, especially on the side of evil. We've got more labels for one another than you can throw throw a rock at. I mean, you're a sanguine or you're a melancholic or you're a phlegmatic or you're a choleric or you're an Irishman or you're a... I'll stop anyway. (laughs) Knowledge of evil is something to be careful with because labeling people... I mean, it goes back to the fall. If you read Genesis 5.1, it says that when God made man and woman, he named them Adam. What did Adam do after the fall? He named Mrs. Adam. They were the original Adam's family. Named her, gave her a name just like he did the animals. Eve. He labeled her. He told God, she's the reason I ate of the forbidden fruit. And so it is in our walk in love towards people, whether it's marriage or with others, we've got to keep a position of looking for the good, looking for the positive. Today I'm wanting to talk about love being positive. Can we say love is positive? Love is positive. It's optimistic. And thinking about this, I I thought about my marriage relationship, which parallels many of yours, that when you get married, you start out believing good things, right? We're going to take the world. We're going to this, we're going to that. Maybe older folks are like, oh, my God, how are they going to make it? I don't know what they thought about us, but all I knew was all I knew was I couldn't I couldn't consider facing life without this girl. I did have second thoughts, but it was just for like two seconds. It was it was on the way from the wedding to the to the reception. And the thought was, My God, what have you done? And then the next thought was, Well, could you face life without having her? No had peace ever since, as far as that's concerned. See, we were positive. I mean, look at the thoughts. She didn't realize that goofball can't keep his eyes open anytime somebody flashes a picture. Don't tell her anything else. Let her be positive. That cake was fruitcake. Never had fruitcake at a wedding until I had my own. Love is positive. I didn't hear that. Is that Zach? Oh, boy, your time's coming, buddy. We were positive. But you know what? We had challenges. 
A few weeks later, we left our families, our siblings, all of our siblings, all of our parents, to move to Texas, where I didn't have any relatives. The girl on the far left is the girl I sent a vet to see in London for her 50th. Remember when I surprised her with that? Uh, The black guy in the back, that's Tudor Bismarck, very famous preacher now. He was in the army then. So we, we were positive. We were positive. This is our first challenge that we overcame because we were positive. Our first car, I love this car. It was, it was uh, identical to, different color, but identical to the favorite car I had growing up. It was a 73 Oldsmobile 98 Regency, fully loaded. <laughs> fully loaded. I think it was the kind where you squeeze the steering wheel and the horn would honk. Anyway. But you couldn't tell where the bumpers were, where they started or ended. You know, you couldn't tell. Was, and my dear wife, who's used to driving little cars... All right, keep in mind we're talking positive here, baby. (laughs) She was always kind of afraid and timid driving it and didn't like to drive it on the roads very much. She was on her way going somewhere and saw this field where she could just take a shortcut. So she drove across this wide open field with grass that was kind of high, and of all things to be in the middle of the field was a fire hydrant, and she hit it and peeled back the fender behind the right, obviously it would be on the right side because she couldn't see over there, peel back the fender to the point you couldn't open the passenger door and you couldn't hit a bump without the tire getting flat spots rubbed on it. (laughs) But we stayed positive. We prayed. We sought the Lord. And I found this guy that fixed cars in his backyard. But you had to find the fender. And I found the fender No, it was the right color, but it didn't have the blinker that shined. This car was so loaded, when you would hit left or right, a headlight would come on on the side of the car and just illuminate the way for you. It didn't have that, but we could could live without that, even though we really needed that. So I went, I I bought it, and then I drove to his house on a Saturday, and I spent an entire Saturday with him changing this thing out. It was so crumpled, the fender was so crumpled, we had to, knock a hole in it and wrap a chain through the hole and around a tree and then back my car up, bam, 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 to pull the fender out so I could get it off. Anyway, when we were done, I never wanted to do it again, but we had overcome a problem. We fixed our car. Unless you knew about the headlight that would turn on when you made a right-hand turn, you never knew it had happened. Well, how do we do that? Others, everybody in this room probably has stories like that. How do you do that? Love is positive, and you just look for solutions. Rather than, than getting the molly grubs, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? You know, I'd like to say I was a perfect husband through this deal. When I came home, I took it calmly. About 30 minutes later, I exploded. You know, what are you doing? But anyway, my point is, love is positive. It just is. Maybe you have friends that have disappointed you, maybe even betrayed you, but if you are called to walk in love, surely. There could be a brighter day ahead in your relationship with that person. Surely. Sometimes you may have to back off and make room for Jesus. But don't just cut people off. Jesus is in the redemption business. Yeah, but the Bible says don't fellowship with evildoers. Well, yes, it does. But it means don't allow them to be an influence with you. You know, don't don't go on vacations with them. You know, but when you see them, greet them. Don't ignore them. I know some pastors that really need to grow in this area. And the reason they don't is they're never challenged. Because they live in big cities. And when someone leaves their church, hurts them or whatever, they never see them again. Not so in Granbury. (laughs) We don't practice shunning around here because it's impossible. You can get mad at me, but you're going to see me again someday. I remember walking into a restaurant where there were several tables of our members sitting there. And all the tables were full, except there was this table with a couple people at it who used to attend our church. What are we going to do? Turn up our noses and walk out? No. We swallowed our pride, 
sat down and fellowship with them, and it was good. It was good because love is positive. Love is positive. We'll never experience reconciliation, which we are called to be the ambassadors of reconciliation, if we're not positive. Who have you labeled? Who have you written off? Who do you hold a grudge against? That's negative. The Africans have a saying that says this, the person you hate has your joy in their pocket. You've suffered long enough. Sounded like an Irishman. You've suffered long enough. <laughs> Love does not rejoice in iniquity. You know, sometimes when someone does you wrong, and then something rough happens to them that maybe they brought on themselves, it can be tempted, it can be a temptation to rejoice. That's not love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. The literal Bible says love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. The basic Bible says love takes no pleasure in wrongdoing. The good news Bible says love is not happy with evil. The complete Jewish Bible says love does not gloat over other people's sins. I wanted to find a sign that said no gloating aloud, but haven't found it yet. If you find one, let me know. The Message Bible says love doesn't revel when others grovel. I love that. It's cool. Why not? Why can't we rejoice in iniquity? Because rejoicing like this is not being loving to everyone. When we are happy over someone's misfortune, that is so evil. We need to really look, at, look in the mirror when that happens, when that temptation comes to us. Doing so worsens wounds that need to be healed. And you'll never be reconciled if you do that. If the word gets back to them that you're happy that they're suffering, this creates another wall. Such things may lessen the impact of what God is doing. You know, when God chastens us, many times he just, in his mercy, allows us to reap what we sow. And nobody sins and gets by with it. Jerks are going to reap consequences. You know, some people think that they intimidated you when you only turn the other cheek. And if they think they intimidated you when you only turn the other cheek, they're going to try that with somebody else who's not going to turn the other cheek. And in the long run, your goodness actually set them up for a whooping. <laughs> when it happens, you know they reap what they sowed, but don't be rejoicing. Proverbs twenty four seventeen verse 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turns away his wrath from him. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Romans 12 says, Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This story is the greatest illustration I know that I can share of this. Years ago in Kenya, I met a minister from Ethiopia named Tekla Marian. He's quite well known now. I'm not sure about all of his doctrine, but I am positive he's got the truth when it comes to forgiveness. His house one day was surrounded by government forces. Because he was a believer, the country was under an atheistic, communistic government at the time. They came to persecute him. They hauled all the furniture out of his house, and he has made him and his wife stand there and watch it burn. And then they snatched up his baby and threw his baby into the flames. And while they were watching, burned the baby alive. Months passed. They survived it. But he did not allow bitterness to take root in his heart. The day came when he heard the leader of those soldiers had a son that was deathly ill. 
and he knew what he had to do. He made his way to that soldier's house and acquired permission to pray for that soldier's son. And you know what God did. He healed that kid. He healed that kid. That's called overcoming evil with good. If we become vengeful people, when does evil stop? It'll never stop. It'll just snowball itself. Revenge is a lie. You never get it. Nobody has the last word. Everybody's out for the last word. It perpetuates itself. Unending. Never ends. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love does not rejoice in sin, but rejoices in the truth. All rumors have some lies in them. And I believe if we are people who rejoice in the truth, we are people who desire to be accurate in our words and in our beliefs. And when you hear of some misfortune that an enemy or ex-friend or ex-spouse is enduring, trust me, you don't know the whole story. You don't know the whole truth. So there is always room for mercy because we live in a fallen world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And some people reap horrible things. And it's not because of what they did. It's just because of the world they live in. So there's always room for our mercy. Vengeance is God's. Mercy is ours. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want to be merciful because I need it. The GJB, I'm not sure which Bible that is, says that love takes delight in the truth. The BBE, Basic Bible, says love has joy in what is true. God's Word translation says love is happy with the truth. And the message says love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. We take joy in, tr- in what is true and pure. What is true in the long run. Maybe in the short run the person is a jerk. And not worthy of blessings. But in the long run, they were created in the image of God. And they are a fallen soul that needs restoration. The Weymouth New Testament says, Love joyfully sides with the truth. And the truth says, Vengeance is God's. And our job is as much as depends upon us to walk peaceably with all men. To be positive. Why does love rejoice in the truth? Truth always gives us a reason to rejoice. That's why we rejoice in the truth. Truth always gives us a reason to rejoice. Maybe the facts are the sky is falling, but the truth is we overcome. Maybe the facts are there's wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and storms and fallouts and relational calamities, but the truth is we overcome. The truth will vindicate all who are slandered. Rejoice in the truth, because sooner or later, my daddy used to say, a lie can go around the world, son, while truth is putting her shoes on. But once the truth starts marching on, glory, hallelujah, we overcome. Truth works. It comes out. Truth with love is the foundation of reconciliation. Truth with love. Speak the truth in love, with love, is the foundation of reconciliation. You've got to have both. Number four, knowing the truth makes us free so we can rejoice. So we rejoice because of the freedom that truth brings us. Truth keeps us from being captive by temporary circumstances. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What does that mean? The truth that makes us free is the truth that we know, which comes to us as a result of living in his words, making us his disciples. If you continue in my words, Jesus said, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it's the truth that we know that makes us free. And we know the truth by abiding in his words. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. 
Freedom will come. We're holding to the truth. We've got a reason to rejoice. Why? We rejoice in the truth because Jesus Christ is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. With him, we always have a reason to rejoice. Number six, we rejoice in the truth that God loves us and is love's personification. He showed us what love is by being that. He is that. Some would use that to condone sin. It doesn't condone sin. It reveals the need for love, which is the greatest need we have in the world as a result of sin. God is what we need. He is love. The lack of love causes sin. In conclusion, I want to read something from day seven of the Love Dare book. It talks about two rooms that we have in our hearts. An appreciation room and a depreciation room. The appreciation room is where your thoughts go when you encounter positive, encouraging things about your spouse. And ever so often, you may visit this special place. On the walls are written kind words and phrases describing the good attributes of your mate. These may include characteristics like honest and intelligent or diligent worker or wonderful cook or breadwinner or good-looking. They are things that you've discovered about your husband or wife or your friend or whatever or enemy that have embedded themselves in your memory. When you think about these things, your appreciation begins to increase. In fact, the more time you spend meditating on these positive attributes, the more grateful you are. But everyone also has a depreciation room in their heart. And unfortunately, we visit it often too much. On its walls are written the things that bother and irritate us about our spouse or those we don't care for. These things are placed there out of frustration, hurt feelings, and disappointments or unmet expectations. The room is lined with the weaknesses and failures of your husband or wife. Their bad habits, their hurtful words, their poor decisions are written in large letters that cover the walls from one end to the other. If you stay in this room long enough, you get depressed and start thinking things like, I married the wrong person. You know, that phrase is one lie. The devil couldn't tell Adam and Eve. All right. Some people write very hurtful things in this room. This room is where they plot their case that they're building against the person that has hurt them. It's where ammo is kept for the next war and bitterness is allowed to spread like disease. Spending time in the depreciation room kills relationships. I don't know where I found this video, but it's perfect. It's a room where some young people are writing things on the wall that are not true. As the video goes on, you'll see what happens to change the whole atmosphere of that wall. And I pray as you watch it that you realize that this is something that we all need to do from time to time to allow the blood of Christ to cleanse the walls of our heart Make us white as snow. Begin to write the truth, the things that are true in our heart. Watch this.
We've heard your word today. Help us to embrace it and allow it to take root. I'm going to ask the praise team as they're coming forward, they're going to sing a song called Order My Steps. And may it be a prayer for you in response to this word. If you see where you've been pessimistic in your love walk or negative, you see the need for being optimistic and positive and hope-filled, make this song your prayer today as they sing and minister to us in song. You can even stand and sing it with them if you want or come and find a place to pray if you'd like or pray at your seat. Please don't rush away till they've sung this song and ministered to us today. Order my steps. Order my steps in